Hello, I'm Kelly Wienersmith and I'm going to be doing a multi-part lecture series on parasitology with an emphasis on parasites of fish. Uh, this lecture series was presented for high school students that are very advanced and are in a summer program doing research at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, most of what I know about parasites I learned in an animal parasitology course at the University of California, Santa Barbara with Armin Curris and Kathleen Whitney. So whatever I get right about parasites, let's go ahead and attribute to them, and whatever I botch is my fault, and you should let me know in the comment section of my website. So we'll get started with the perhaps not uh, particularly exciting task of working with definitions. So there are a number of different types of animal interactions, uh, and one of them is parasitism. Uh, but first let's start by describing commensalism. So commensalism is an interaction between two organisms uh, in which the guest, we'll call it, uh, benefits, whereas the host has no negative impacts uh, felt by this interaction at all. So for example, uh, cattle egret are known to follow around cattle and uh, camels and horses to eat the insects that get kicked up by their hooves as they move, to move around. And this doesn't hurt the camels or the horses or the cattle in any way, uh, but it provides foods for the cattle egret. So it's good for the guest and doesn't hurt the host. Uh, there are other kind. There are types of commensalisms. So, for example, foracy is one type, and foracy is when one organism travels on the other. So, for example, in the center picture, there's a fly who is carrying around a pseudoscorpion. Uh, presumably, the pseudoscorpion doesn't weigh very much, and so the fly is in no way uh, harmed by carrying around its little passenger. Uh, the final call, uh, another kind of commensalism is inquilism, and that's when one organism lives on or in another. So for, exa for example, birds that live in trees, as long as they're not uh, putting a hole in the tree, uh, would be a type of inquilism. And in the picture on the far right, we have a barnacle that's living on the shell of a mollusk of some sort. Another type of interaction is mutualism, and this is a case in which both the guest and the host benefit. So on the left, we have the classic mutualism example of clownfish living in a sea anemone, <laughs> and the anemone benefits by having the clownfish because the clownfish chase away predators, and additionally it's believed that the excrement from the clownfish, so the urine and the feces that they produce, might provide the anemone with some sort of uh, nutrition or with nutrients that they couldn't get on their own. And the anemone provides a place for them to live uh, and also helps protect the clownfish. Another type of mutualism is cleaner wrasses that will set up cleaning stations for other fish. So in the picture on the right, you have a fish who uh, is being cleaned up by two cleaner wrasses. And you can see that one of the cleaner wrasses right here is sticking its head underneath the operculum, which is this flap right here that covers up the gills. And he's reaching in there and he's pulling off all of the, the para ectoparasites that have uh, attached to the gills of that fish. So for example, he might be pulling off copepods or isopods. Uh, and this fish is, is likewise cleaning off ectoparasites on the fish. Uh, so this is a case where the cleaner fish get a free meal and the host fish uh, gets all of his parasites removed, which could be uh, and the parasites could be removing the mucus, or removing blood, or just generally debilitating the fish, and so this is a good situation for both individuals. A not-so-positive situation is competition, uh, and this is, uh, guest and host doesn't really seem to apply very well here, but this is a case in which two individuals or two species are uh, competing for resources. So there's limited resources, and they need to be split, and uh, so one individual is always suffering because it has to fight with or compete with this other one in order to get some resources. Uh, competition can be intraspecific, like in the picture. So these are two individuals of the same species, and in this case they're fighting over a mate, or interspecific, and this is when individuals of different species are competing for the same resource. Parasitism is an instance in which the guest benefits and the host uh, experiences negative consequences. So for example, in the bottom left, there's a fish that's infected with copepod parasites, and these parasites have uh, attached into the eye of that fish, and so that's good because it's a great food source for the parasite, but it's bad news for the host. Uh, and then on the right, we have Schistosoma mansoni, which is a parasite of humans, uh, and we provide a home for these parasites, and they in turn do some pretty nasty stuff to our bodies. Um, Right, so to review the different interaction types, there's commensalism, where the guest benefits and nothing bad happens to the host. There's mutualism, where the guest and the host both uh, benefit. There's parasitism, where the guest benefits and the host suffers. And there's competition, where uh, everybody loses. 
So two terms that are commonly confused are parasites and pathogens. So a pathogen is an organism that reproduces in the host and the offspring will stay in the host individual. So um, this is any parasite that will invade in the host, like bacteria, for example, can infect a human and then they start reproducing. And now you have more bacteria in there because that one individual reproduced and uh, created more bacteria in you. So typically a pathogen will build up, one individual can come on in and the whole bacteria population can build up to high numbers and the host needs to eliminate it by the immune system because otherwise they'll just re keep reproducing. Whereas parasites don't produce offspring that stay in the same host. So they still produce offspring but the eggs will pass out with the feces for example and they'll infect some other uh, host. The offspring will infect another host, not the same host that their parents are in. Uh, and so the effects are density dependent, So every, which means every time you're encountered by one parasite, then your pathology increases a little bit uh, with that one. So that individual, that one individual doesn't produce an infection of 100 individuals, you have to encounter 100 individuals uh, separately in order to get an infection of 100. Uh, in some cases, parasites can be tolerated rather than eliminated, so if you have one or two nematodes living in your gut, for example, they probably don't do you much harm and so your body can handle the fact that they're there and just sort of try to ignore them rather than putting a lot of immune system energy into trying to knock them out. So, <clears throat> so that's the difference between pathogens and parasites. Now parasites and pathogens can be divided even further and they're divided uh, and so can predators and they're all divided into uh, types of natural enemies. So Lafferty and Kurtz in 2002 wrote a paper in which four different questions were used to divide up all the different kinds of parasites, pathogens, and predators that are out there. Uh, and their scheme for dividing things up was first you have to ask the question how many victims does the enemy attack in its lifetime? So, uh, for example, if the enemy is a predator, then it attacks multiple prey in its lifetime. If the enemy is a parasite, it will attack one prey in its lifetime. So the question is, uh, is the harm to the host, quote unquote, uh, is it one host or is it many hosts? Second question is, what happens to host fitness? So, again, when you have a predator attacking a quote unquote host or its prey, uh, it will kill that prey if it's successful. Whereas parasites and pathogens may or may not kill their host. Uh, they might be able to live on for a long time in that host. Uh, third question, does the enemy require the death of its host? So for example, there are uh, parasitoids, which are essentially a, a type of parasite maybe you could say. Uh, and these parasitoids are usually bugs that infect, for example, a caterpillar and they will lay their eggs inside of this caterpillar and in order for the offspring to leave the host they have to kill it on their way out so the parasites or the parasitoid larva will essentially eat the caterpillar from the inside and then burst out of it so the host necessarily needs to die in order for the parasitoid to be doing what it needs to do uh, whereas parasitic castrators are parasites that make it so that their host can no longer breed but the host doesn't need to die, it just doesn't reproduce anymore. Uh, and then the fourth question is, is the pathology density dependent? So uh, does one encounter produce the most extreme pathology like I was talking about where if you are infected by a pathogen it can reproduce in you and just encountering one of that pathogen uh, could potentially give you a very extreme version or extreme case of illness. Uh, whereas if you encounter nematodes for example, each nematode uh, does damage to you but doesn't reproduce more offspring that will continue to infect you. Okay, so we can use those four different questions to classify parasites into a number of different categories. So the first question that I talked about uh, was how many victims does the enemy attack in its lifetime? And that question is used to divide parasites and to separate parasites and predators. So predators over here on the far right uh, attack more than one host in their lifetime whereas parasites usually only attack one, par uh, one host in their lifetime or in a life stage. Uh, the next question is victim fitness. So by fitness we mean does the host survive and is the host able to reproduce? So if host fitness equals zero, then it's dead or can't reproduce. And so in the host fit, uh, yeah, the victim fitness equals zero category, we have parasitic castrators, which I described earlier, which are individuals who 
kill their host because their larva will eat the host and then burst out of it essentially afterwards. So the host necessarily needs to die. Uh, oh, sorry, that's parasitoids. Parasitic castrators are parasites that uh, do something to the host gonads such that the hosts are no longer able to produce offspring themselves or produce offspring period. So their fitness is zero and that they will not be producing any more offspring. Uh, predators, not surprisingly, reduced host fitness to zero because they kill them. And trophically transmitted parasitic castrators both castrate their host, making it so it can't reproduce, and they require that their host dies. And the reason they require their host die, and this is the same as happens for trophically transmitted typical parasites, is that uh, in order for the host to get to the next stage in its life cycle, it needs one of the hosts in that life cycle to get eaten by the next one. So for example, uh, trophically transmitted typical parasites, uh, one life cycle is snail to bird to, sorry, snail to fish to bird. And in that life cycle, when the parasite is infecting fish, they need the fish to be eaten by predatory birds in order to make it to that next stage in the life cycle. So all of these require or will actively reduce the fitness of their host. Uh, for uh, parasites that don't require uh, the death of their host, you have typical parasites like nematode, like most nematodes that uh, just infect the gut, for example, and take blood meals and the host doesn't need to die. They're just sapping them of a little bit of their energy. Uh, most pathogens don't kill their host either. Uh, trophically transmitted typical parasites do not uh, castrate their host so their host can still reproduce. Same with trophically transmitted pathogens. And micropredators are uh, predators that take small meals from their host. So for example, mosquitoes will land on you, suck, suck your blood, and then go off and suck the blood of some other organism. Uh, and this is the same thing with leeches. They have multiple uh, individuals that they take some energy from and then go to take energy from some other individual without killing any of them, typically. Uh, then, <clears throat> is the death of the host required? For typical parasites, pathogens, and parasitic castrators, the answer is no. Even though the host isn't reproducing anymore, its, it's survival is, uh, we could maybe say, good in all of these cases because it allows these individuals to survive. But, if the death, but in some instances, the death of the host is required. So for example, parasitoids require that their host die so that their larva can leave the host. Uh, anything that's trophically transmitted needs its host to die at some point in order to get to the next stage in the life cycle. And uh, just to be clear, trophic refers to the different uh, feeding levels. So um, it, it basically refers to a feeding interaction. We'll talk more about this in later lectures. Um, and finally, anything that is above this white line is intensity dependent. So the more nematodes that you encounter, the more pathology you feel because the more blood that they're sucking. And below the line is intensity independent. So you encounter one, paras one pathogen, the intensity of the initial uh, infection moment is one. One of them infects you, and then you get the full range of pathology from being infected with one. Whereas pathology increases uh, linearly, for example, as the number of parasites increases. So intensity dependent, intensity independent. Okay, uh, that's the scheme. And if you want to learn more about it, you should check out Lafferty and Curtis 2002. And you can put a comment in my, uh, on my website and I can send that paper to you if you're interested.